because we are in fact making a little mini golf or mini putt game. Uh, growing up, I don't know, like mini, well, we always call it mini putt here um, as opposed to mini golf, but depending on where you're from, there's going to be different preferences. Growing up, it seemed like mini putt courses were everywhere. You couldn't turn a corner without there being one. And not only that, but like every computer had like, you know, 20 different mini putt games available for it that you could purchase it way, way, way back then. It was, um, I don't know, it was very in. And now, like, I, I don't know. I don't, like, I can't remember the last time I've seen a mini putt course anywhere in real life. And uh, not that many games for it. I don't know. I always really, really, really enjoyed it. It was just a fun thing, you know, to go to the whole the family, bring a couple of friends, that sort of thing. Uh, you have 1,700 hours in Stardew Valley. Holy crap, cool man. That might be more hours than... I have in any game. I'm trying to think about it. I don't know. Yes, yeah, so this is the first stream for this project, and the intention with this one is actually to have the idea was to, to pick a game that would be relatively limited in scope, so that we could finish it in one go. I don't want this to be one of the things that we need multiple sessions for, because sometimes they sort of fall off and distraction and life comes up, and then too much time has passed, and I don't know where to go anymore. So we're gonna hopefully be able to do it in one go. Okay, not wow. You're right. World of Warcraft though doesn't have a. Um, it doesn't have like a Steam thing for the time, but yeah, I know that some of my characters in WoW, the slash played time is is very very high. We're gonna say that, but in terms of Steam, I don't know um, which uh, what what I have. I mean, I know I have an over a thousand hours in EU four and possibly both Civ five and Civ six. Civ four is a little fuzzy because I played some on pre Steam versions and things like that. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. You have a mini golf course right next to your house? Oh my god, that's amazing. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about the programming here. So, we're making a little mini golf game, uh, which is gonna involve making, you know, we're gonna have a little, um, well, a hole or a level. Let's call it level, okay? I mean, technically, you know, if you're, if you're going, whether you're golfing, like, real golf or, or, or mini golf, you know, each, each thing, it's a hole, but to me, the hole, like, where we're talking about here would represent the actual, you know, hole as opposed to the whole course track whatever so we'll probably refer to them as levels here because everyone will sort of understand what we say uh when we mean level plus this is um you know it's a game so level seems relatively appropriate what we'll probably do is whip together maybe two just to technically have the ability to swap between a couple um and uh we'll do that and then we're going to want to have the ability to uh bounce the ball the, the bounce the ball around um and uh Score some three-pointer grand slams, right? Uh, you aiming something along the line? See, I've never played golf with your friends. I was gonna say, golf with your friends, as far as I know, is the only sort of mini putt game that's uh, oot and a boot these days. And I've actually never played it. But the interesting thing is, it wouldn't be that hard to add multiplayer to this either. If we do a follow-up stream, it might be some multiplayer multiplayerification of it. Although, we had issues, the last stream that we did was a multiplayer stream, and we ran to the problem where um, the cur well, current multiplayer stuff in Unity is deprecated, but the new stuff isn't quite out yet. So we're in this really fuzzy in-between time um, that's a little bit awkward there. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, I, said, I don't think there's a programming category. There's a creative category. And then I think what you do is you add, uh, I guess there's basic programming, there's science and technology. I think the idea is to put hashtags in for, for things, um, yeah, programming, uh, game programming, game development, there we go, I'll up upload that, so we've got some tags for it, but, science and technology for game dev, I guess that would make the most appropriate, it used to be they just had the, um, the creative category, and then yeah, you'd use the tags, but there we go, uh, we'll throw that in, and see if that's most appropriate for Twitch. Science and tech, which is weird because it encapsulates all of the computing. I know, it, it's weird to me that they don't have just a clear, like, like, game programming category because it's actually something that is fairly frequent on Twitch and, and dovetails nicely with their, um, um, their gaming um, audience. Anyway, we're gonna start off, we're gonna just make the first level real quick. And for that, we're gonna pop into Blender over here. So Blender is free, open source, uh, 3D stuff. We're gonna go fairly quick with it. That thing, what was that? Was that Bits? It was Bits from Brogantic. Thank you very much. Mmm, 
This, oh, Subway. Oh, that's right, because Subway is like sponsoring Twitch this month. They've got the custom emote, but also uh, it's September. So if you haven't subbed before, uh, subs are half price um, for se September. So uh, it's a good time to do it if you haven't done it before. Anyway, this is not gonna be sort of a, a too much of a Blender tutorial, but I'm gonna give you enough that you can easily replicate this. So this is Blender. Um, I have an empty scene here. Normally, if you start with a new a project, there'll be some um, some some garbage in here. Like there'll be a, there's like what a default cube and things like that that you'll want to get rid of. Um, the easiest way to do it, the A key in Blender uh, toggles between selecting everything and selecting nothing. Although sometimes for some reason it seems to stall out on me. Like I don't I don't know why, but sometimes it seems to like stop working. Um, just in Blender 2.8, which I, I, at least I think this is the version number here. I, I don't know what happened there. But you can select it all with A and then hit X to delete everything. Um, what I like to do, clear out everything and then go and save um, defaults, save startup file. And so that way you'll start with an empty project instead of the one that's got a cube, a light, and a camera in it. Because we don't need any of that shit over there. Um, yeah, Blender 2.8 is really pretty. Um, and I suspect the UI is is much stronger for it. I'm still I'm still actually adapting a little bit to the uh, the new Blender UI because it has been a while since I've worked with things. Um, but we'll see how it goes. Thanks for all the uh, we got some gift subs coming in from uh, from Shonix. Hey, thank you very much, Shonix. Uh, and oh yeah, we'll have to do maybe we'll do it between the programming stream and the start of gaming. We'll do a read of the uh, the resubs of everyone. Normally I do it at the start. The A shortcut changed. A no longer toggles like it used to. A Selects, double tapping a deselects. How? I could probably change that. Uh, one of the other things I changed is the preferences over in key map over here, the spacebar action. Um, I think, was it defaulting to play or something? Anyway, I put it back to search, which is what I would like to use. Okay, thank you very much for that. Anyway, um, we're gonna make the course. So, so what I wanna do for the, the track, the, the level here, is I'm just gonna start with a flat plane and sort of stretch it out. Now. We need to figure out kind of units, like what size things should be. Um, the the standard way of operating in Unity is to treat each each unit, each world unit, as one meter. Okay, um, and I think that's probably fair. I guess we'll sort of work with that. How big is your is a normal sort of kind of you know mini putt little track? I don't know. Do we want to do the first one? four meters long by one meter wide. I mean, that's not very big, but we can just play with that and fiddle around with it. And it'll be a good starter, most likely. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna add in, there we go, shift A, add in, we're gonna add in a plane. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's a, well, it's a plane. Um, and put one in. So this is just a flat little mesh in here. And um, by default, it's, it's apparently two by two. Maybe two meters wide is gonna be okay. I'm trying to think, if you're on a thing, because one meter is like this. No, two meters wide does kind of make sense because when you are, you're, well, you don't tee up in mini putt, but if you imagine it, the, the, the tee is gonna be sort of like, where you start your ball is sort of gonna be in the middle here. And by one meter to each side, gives you just about enough room to sort of stand here, whether you're left-handed or right-handed to putt out. Two by six or seven seems usual. Yeah, I kind of like that idea. Uh, so what I'm gonna do here, right now in object mode, if I hit tab, we'll go into mesh mode over here. So yeah, single A. Oh, select all, but double tap A, deselects. Okay. I guess it's fine. My muscle memory for it is still gonna be different, but, um, but that's fine. So we got the plane over here, so it's two by two. We'll leave it a width of two. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to hit B for a box select, drag here to grab the first two vertices. Uh, and then I'm gonna hit G for like grab. Um, and we can start pulling this around. What I wanna do is I wanna lock this to just one axis. Um, so if I hit Y, I'll only be dragging it along the Y axis over here. And actually I could even hit a number. So if I hit Four, there we go. So it's gonna move it four meters along the, or four units along the Y axis. And I think that's pretty good. I'll enter to stop that. Double tap A to deselect. All right, I'm getting used to it. Um, and there we have that. The, uh, the zero, zero point here could be where we start the putting from. I suspect what'll happen is we'll be placing the, the T in, inside of Unity for where the ball starts. Similarly to how we're gonna place the hole. One of the most annoying things and this is something I learned uh, from trying to do pinball games for a while, is when you're, like cutting a hole 
into a surface for your ball to fall under is kind of a pain in the ass. It actually leads to really ugly geometry because cutting a hole, like to a roundish hole is maybe gonna have like 16 or 32 vertices along the way. And then it's gonna have to create all these triangles as part of the mesh to connect over here. You're doing awkward Boolean operations to carve that in. And then the worst thing is, what happens if you decide you wanna move the hole? In, in your, you know, your pinball machine or your mini putt thing. It's hugely annoying to do that. Really, really, really miserable to do it. Which is why I actually made a whole tutorial, a whole tutorial. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to pun, but it was, it was delicious apparently, um, at least to me, uh, for making fake holes in Unity. Uh, if you watch Rick and Morty, you got real fake doors. Well, we got real fake holes here. Anyway, uh, that is, uh, this is going to be our little starting area. What I want to do is I do want to get some, some walls up here so that we can't, very wholesome, <laughs> um, so that we, uh, we can't lose the ball. All right. So what I want to do is I sort of want to like extrude upwards. Actually, let's make this a little bit more interesting. Let's use, um, if I could control R and mouse wheel up, we can put a couple of little cuts in here. And then what I can do is maybe, there you go. We could, we could have something that's slightly more interesting that way. Um, now I'm trying to think of the best way to extrude the walls up. Probably is just selecting the edges and then extruding that way. Um, how do we actually, first of all, go into well, if I just select everything and go extrude edges, I don't think that's gonna do what I want. No, that, that is not quite what I want. Um, do I just wanna select just the edges? You know what's actually the best way to do this, I think? Um, where's, okay, where's the selection modes? The UI has changed, so I'm a little bit lost. If uh, if I just hit L, it's not really going to do what I want. Yeah, copy the edge vertices is sort of what I'm thinking. Um, yeah, extrude edge, because like, it could. It could hit E, escape, um, and then scale outward. That's not really what I'm looking to do, though. Because normally what I would do is I would extrude like up and then in and things. A loop slice. What's, I'm just trying to think of the best way to select this. Okay, and select. Maybe I'll just, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna duplicate what we have here. Um, then what I'm gonna do is it P to separate the selection. So now I have two objects. I think this is probably going to be the way I'm going to be the happiest with doing it because I want to keep the ground plane separate from the wall objects. So it'll make it a little easier to clean it um, or something like that. So let me call this the um, walls. So in my wall object, I'm going to tab into this. Um, and then here I'm going to extrude this upwards. Let me scale it up slightly. I'll just extrude it upwards and remove some planes and invert things. Uh, it's not exactly what I was thinking of doing. And I'm sure there's a better way, but um, I'm just gonna get rid of these faces here, 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 and the ground one. Okay. So what I have here is I have two objects. I have this one here, which is just the walls, and I have another one that's just the flat part of the map. I think there's probably a slightly cleaner way to do it, but we'll see. Now, the one issue going on here is that the normals for this are going to be faced in the wrong way. In 3D gaming stuff, polygons, like faces and whatnot like this, only render on one side for like many, 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 many different optimization uh, bonuses. In Blender by default, it, it, it renders both sides of something. But if we were bringing this into Unity, only the outside would be rendered. The inside face here would be invisible. So I think what we'll do is we'll just select this and there, see, here's the thing with the new version of, um, of Blender here. 
I don't know how to get it to show the normals, uh, which would make it obvious what the heck was going on. It's fairly easy to invert the normals, but I'm trying to see how do we show the normals? Because, I mean, we can just invert normals, that's easy, but I'm not sure that showing the normals is going to be in here. Because we're just looking to flip normals. But you can't, you can't see that anything has happened here. Um, oh, well, I can turn on backface calling. There we go. At least this will show us. So you can see here now what's happening is it's rendering the inside of this, but not the outside. That's not necessarily what I want to do still, but it'll work for now. It'll work for now. Um, it'll still look a little weird in Unity, but it's not too bad. Uh, what I might do is just lower the walls a little bit. At least this will function. The idea is we're going to get something that works. Oh, uh, okay. Zed doesn't just toggle the uh, wireframe mode anymore. That's interesting. I'm just going to shrink this down a little. But there we go. And then go back to uh, showing me render or solid. And yeah, let's see. That's what I was doing before. I popped this up with N, but I can't see the display normals anymore. Like, N would bring up this little property page and would have a little checkbox to display normals. But they've moved it. Maybe I shouldn't have upgraded to the latest version of Blender, because I ain't know... I ain't know nothing about it. Anyway, let's go ahead and save this. Uh, F Unity Projects, Mini Put Assets, Levels. So we're going to call this uh, Level 1. Boom. Done, done, done. And we'll just pop back into here. I know how to do it in... Button with two rings on the one, one top filled, one empty his normals. Um, this guy over here? Oh, if we have the solidify modifier? Maybe. So are the modifier still over here? You not know, search that window? Yeah, good call with the solidify. That, that probably is going to be better. All right. So we'll go ahead and do this. I don't know if we've got to do anything with the um, uh, slicing the normals. We'll see. So we've saved it into level. We've got level zero over here. Let's see what happens if we just drop this into our scene. And are we happy with things? Ah, it looks, um, looks about right to me. Face orientation that dropped down to the top. It's not face orientation that I was looking for in these pop-ups. It's there's um to show the normals, it'll be a little line. It's face orientation. I mean maybe, but that's not what I'm looking for either. The the show normals um was would draw a little line, but anyway. Uh do, 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 do. fix the shadows. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a shadow difference thing. We'll deal with that in a second. Anyway, we've, we've got our little level in here. Excellent. Um, one of the things we're going to want to do is probably have a mesh. It looks a little weird because I wasn't in perspective mode. But there we go. That looks better. Isome I like to work in isometric mode because I find it a lot easier to work in. In particular, what I like about isometric mode is that the camera is um, an orbit around whatever object you're sort of centered on. Whereas when you're in perspective mode in Unity, the camera instead, like, I don't know, pans. I don't know the camera terms um, in here, but that's not usually the mode I want to work in because mostly I'm using it to, you know, work around whatever I'm, object I'm in and placing things. <laughs> anyway, we're going to ignore the viewport thing because we've got to move on, guys. Uh, so we've got our simple little level. I've got, oh, we do have to do one more thing because I want to apply a texture to our plane here. Uh, in my fake hole project, um, when you got, would di download this, uh, there'll be a readme explaining things, including a link to the old, the original fake hole project, uh, which explains how we did this. But I do have a grass texture I want to apply to the plane. But, oh, I guess, hmm, it actually started with fairly sane U UVs. Did it really? Why does it have fairly sane UVs? I don't know. But we'll take it. Done. Uh, we're going to leave the walls white. So there's a little field that we're going to be going on. 
boxes have good use. But the, but it's because I've got a, I've, I made this a plane and then I jerked these vertices side to side. So I was expecting there to be a bunch of distortion. Uh, I guess there is actually where it's there. It's just the texture doesn't really show it. So, all right, well, we'll just move on. We can, uh, when we get a more complicated thing, we'll probably have to look into UV stuff, but if we can ignore that, that's great. All right, we're also gonna need a ball in the level, right? So let's go ahead and just go and make a, what's the best place to do it? Probably in here. Create the 3D object. We'll get ourselves a sphere, which is gonna be our ball. Now, this ball is way too big because by default, the ball spawns in with, I wanna say a radius of one? No, diameter of one, okay. So this is a one meter by one meter ball. Uh, so what we wanna do is shrink it. Now the question is, uh, what is the diameter of a golf ball? 42.62 millimeters. I mean, it was probably um, imperial, 1.68 inches. Even in inches, it's kind of awkward. Um, let's go ahead and uh, we'll call it 43 millimeters as a diameter. So since right now, it's currently one meter on a one scale. We can safely go and say 0.043 in all three scale directions. We should end up with something that looks roughly golf ball size on this. It looks it looks tiny to me, but I don't know. If we go and position you at zero, 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 um, I guess if we do that, you'll actually be uh, half embedded into the ground here. But there we go. Is that appropriate? I guess it's... I guess that seems about right. Sure, can we make it 42? That that would be pretty good, wouldn't it? Just because the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Technically, we're rounding down incorrectly, but there we go. Well, our golf ball will be 42 millimeters in size. Now, if we want this to be a physics-enabled object, it does need a collider on it, as well as a rigid body. But at this point, if we go and hit play, of course, it's gonna fall through the ground because we have not told Unity that there should be any kind of collision on our level geometry over here. So that's what we're gonna do now. On our plane, we'll add in, well, we'll use a mesh collider. So a mesh collider will be, we'll use the triangles of the actual like graphics of this. Although, I mean, you can replace what mesh is being used, but by default, it'll use the same mesh as what is set to the mesh render on this object. So it's using that, that object called plane over here. Um, and that's gonna be good. Remember, we might decide later on to make uh, levels that have like hills and bumps and things like that. So we can't just like cheat and like throw a big, like, you know, some sort of invisible plane in here. We have to use the mesh collider. So now if we hit play, the ball, there we go, hits the surface. We'll wanna do the same thing with the walls. And I will use a mesh collider over here. Um, the one thing you have to remember about mesh colliders is that two different mesh colliders can't really collide with each other. So if you're doing physics-y things and you want like two like oddly shaped objects to be able to intercollide in some sort of physics-y way, um, generally speaking, you're gonna have to take one of them and build the colliders out of um, other types of primitive shapes. So if you do convex stuff, um, that can work as well. And then you get this sort of fuzzy thing. But anyway, we're gonna be fine here. Put random invisible wall for fun. Oh yeah, fun, that, that does sound fun. Yeah, we can talk about making things static as well, but we'll, uh, we'll leave that there for now. Let's go and give a little bit of extra flavor to our ball over here. I have a, uh, a material ready to go here, which is gonna add dimples to our golf balls. Hey, excellent stuff. Now we've got a proper golf ball loaded in. So I just, I wanted to get some of the uh, the, the visuals ready a little bit ahead of time. So I wouldn't be spending my time uh, Googling for an appropriate texture. I got links to the, uh, the source of these in that readme. Okay, good. So we've got a ball that can land. Lovely. What we need now is let's get the hole figured out. So again, getting the hole carved into the mesh is a big pain in the butt, especially if at any point you might decide to change where the hole is, which is why we have this fake hole project. And um, again, I have a full video for this, but I'm gonna go and talk about how it works a little bit. This hole prefab here, if I go and drop it into our world, uh, it's gonna be way too large to scale difference. Um, but uh, let's do the same scaling, because I think this was set up for a default ball that's like one meter by one meter. So let's shrink this down in the same proportion, and we'll check to see how that feels next to our ball. So um, let's zero, zero, zero U, come down here. I think, I think the hole needs to be a little bit bigger. I think a golf hole is 
a little larger than this compared to the ball. Stream is going to be full of, of ball and hole phrasings. Uh, golf holes are 4.25 inches. So that's um, like two and a half times bigger in diameter than a golf ball-ish, just ballparking it, something like that. I mean, it's already bigger here. I think what I'm going to do is do something like um, 0.7. Just arbitrarily. There you go. That might be a little larger than it needs to be, but, you know, it's, it's just mini putt. We can make it a little easier. We can scale in 4.25 freedom units. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's pretty good over here. Now, this hole visually... What am I changing here? If I hold down the right click and mouse wheel, is it changing some sort of snapping distance or something? I don't know. That's your camera speed. But it's not, it doesn't seem to be changing. Maybe, maybe camera movement or um, maybe if I was in perspective mode. Anyway, we'll leave that there. Scroll and move speed. Oh, what? When maybe when I'm using the arrow keys to move around? Let's see. Ah, yeah. If you're using the arrow keys to move around. Okay, that's good to know hasn't come up before um so right now this hole is a visual trick it is not actually um yeah see i'm used to i don't know when they added it in there's probably a way to disable it i'm used to holding down the right mouse button and doing this and then scrolling in and out and continuing to uh to cycle around here it's a little annoying to have to drop that drop the right click and then pan around there's probably a way to disable that uh but that definitely didn't used to be in there this camera trick works thusly. Again, I've got a full tutorial for it, uh, so we don't, we're not going to go into nitty gritty here. But the um, this hole has um, two different visuals to it. There's this mesh that I called kick out hole because originally this was made for pinball, um, and you can see from the outliner like what this looks like over here. And then there's this thing called depth mask over here, and it's just a cylinder. The depth mask, what it does, if I go and disable the kick out hole, you'll be able to see what depth, ma depth mass does. What it does is it um, prevents rendering of objects over here. It gets rendered before everything else. And um, in terms of the 3D generation engine, when the 3D gen engine is then going and putting down the terrain, the terrain thinks, oh, there's already some graphics here that I'm not supposed to override. Is, is basically what's going on. So it's leaving that unpainted. And then after that, as a separate sort of layer in the rendering, then we go and have the kick out hole here. I did this in our tutorial by having custom shaders put in here. Um, technically the render order, so the render queue, uh, apparently you can change it on the fly through code, but it's fine. So we've got a depth mask um, shader over here and the whole shader. The whole shader here is just a standard material. In every way it's a standard material, it just has a slightly different render queue. You can see it renders on 1998, whereas the depth mask renders on 1999. And the ball also has its own custom shader also on 1998, which is basically the same over here. You can look at that video, which will be um, linked in this project, or you can search my channel for it, um, for exactly how we figured out how to make this work. But basically, it's tweaking the order that it renders things in and prevents the grass. The grass is actually here, and actually you'll be able to see it. If I hit play, the ball is still hitting the tabletop over here. It's still physically there. We're just using visual tricks to not show you this grass texture, just as close as I could get to sort of a, like that green carpet astroturfy kind of thing on a quick Google search. It's still physically there, which is why the ball is hitting it, but we don't see it. So how do you make it so that the ball can actually fall into this hole? Because this hole, well, I mean, the whole object exists, but there's still a tabletop here. Well, again, if you watch the tutorial, what we do is we have a slight trick where we have this collider here. We have this trigger over here that detects when the ball is entering this area. And when the ball enters this area, we change the collision rules with the ball so that it can no longer collide with our, our, our tabletop or our grass surface. Um, we tell it they can no longer collide with the tabletop. Instead, the only thing it could collide with at that point is this so-called kickout hole. And that allows the ball to drop through the table, which you can't see, but drop through it into the cup. 
Do do do. Are you using shader graph for? Um, it's not a shader graph. I um, I tweak just some shader stuff, but it's like the easiest, simplest thing. It's basically the the two standard shaders, just like render queue difference, and the depth mask is also a pretty standard thing, um, which it doesn't like render any visuals. It doesn't draw anything, but it does write to the the Z index buffer to say, hey, there's something here, don't render over me kind of thing. And that's it. Again, full tutorial, you can watch that one. So what we need to do now is we have to wire this collider to change what layer this ball is on. Now, the prefab I have to set up for this already has a script, which is from our tutorial, um, which is this, boom, change ball layer script. And all it does, it can be even renamed to something a little bit more generic, it has an on enter trigger when the object enters here. There we go. Um, it checks that it's tagged with player, which is how we did it. We may you may want to change like the the tagging system for detecting or whatever, but player worked with us. So it's just checking to see if the thing that is entering or exiting the trigger is the player object, which is a ball. So we need to make sure our ball over here has the tag of player and there's other ways to check it but this is going to be what we're going to use here if it does it's going to change the layer of this object to layer enter and then when it leaves it's going to change the layer to layer on exit so what we're going to have for this ball is its normal layer is going to be the default layer and in unity um we can take a look at our layers over here if we go to project settings and we go to hang on i've got it on the wrong screen but i'm going to bring it over actually i have to clear it a couple things there we go so project settings, and then there's tags and layers over here. These are all the layers that you can create, you know, sort of arbitrary amounts. Um, by default, everything gets the default layer over here. So what we're going to do is we're going to make another layer, which is going to be the ball in hole layer. Um, in, the, uh, in their pinball project, technically, I have a separate layer for the ball on the table because um, I filter out the collisions in different ways. But basically, we're just going to change the ball from default to ball and hole, and then back to default as things happen. And what we need to do is we then go into the physics tab over here and we adjust the collisions. This is what is allowed to coll collide with whatever. And basically what we need to do um, is, oh, I do need one more layer in here. Uh, this is gonna be the, this is like the hole collider in here. Because when the things that have the ball and hole layer can only collide with the whole collider and they won't collide with anything else. So that's what we need to change in the physics system over here. Uh, there we go. So yeah, ball in hole isn't gonna collide with anything at all, except for ball and hole and whole collider, they will collide with each other and that is it. Default will still collide with everything else. So normally the ball is gonna be on the default layer so it can collide with the, the, you know, the tabletop surface, the walls, the windmills, or, or whatever, um, but when it activates this special collider over here, we need to change it. So um, if we check our, I need to open this again, our layers, when we enter the collision, we wanna change the ball to layer eight, which is the ball in hole, and then when it leaves the collider, it needs to get reset to layer zero, which is default. And if we do that, if I have done everything correctly, which we'll see, if I hit play, Layer player. Oh, there you go. This has to be on the default layer so that the normal ball can actually collide with it. Uh, oh no, hold on. Yeah, this whole thing, this whole thing needs to be the whole collider layer. There we go. And I think I'm missing something. Yes, I am. Um, it's very important that the objects on the default layer still interact with the whole collider. That's what I did a mistake. Um, actually, whole collider can have everything enabled. It's just ball and hole can't interact with anything else. Okay, let's try this again. Because what was happening... There we go. There we go. Perfect. The ball wasn't actually colliding with the collider because the default layer wasn't set to collide with whole collider. So now what's happening, it'd be nice if we could do it in slow motion. As the ball falls, it enters this collider. The code on this is gonna change the ball's layer. If we look at the ball's layer right now, it's on default. 
as it enters that, it changes to ball and hole, at which point it can no longer collide with the surface. The only thing it can collide with is, is the cup over here, the hole. So there, it has done that, and then it falls in and it sits over there. Um, we have set things up that if the ball were to somehow come out of this, there you go, it does, it's hard to see, if you stare over here, it'll pop into default for a second there before falling over. There we go, if I just move it over here, everything is fine. If I move it back over here, it falls into the hole. Our physics work. And what's nice about that, and yes, this will go on YouTube on the Quilly Team Creates channel. What's nice about this is by doing it this way, instead of physically cutting a hole in the mesh, is I can move the uh, the hole around. So by dragging this whole prefab to a different area, we can change where this is. And it saves so much time because otherwise you'd have to go back and blender, physically cut out holes again. Are you happy with it? Are you not? Blah, blah, blah. And here again, we can rescale. We can make the hole bigger or smaller depending on, you know, game balance and various things like that. Okay, so we got you over here. Um, let's get our ball on the other side of this bad boy, say over here. And uh, now we need to make it so the player can interact with it. That's about it. Mm -hmm. You can make a mobile hole in game too. That's, ch oh my God, I didn't even think about that. But theoretically, because this is a computer game, if we're willing to like, you know, become unreal, <laughs> there's no reason you couldn't make it so that for whatever reason, the hole actually moves in the game. Maybe does a little figure eight over here for super difficulty mode. And that would actually work. Oh my God, that's so funny. It moves as you get closer to it. The hole runs away from you. <laughs> Put the hole in the la spinning Lazy Susan. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it so that it could move it in game. I did it so that I could like move it around if I'm not happy where the position of it is out of game as I'm designing the course. But yeah, you're absolutely right. This can change dynamically while you play. I had not, that had not occurred to me. That's really funny. Could do an inverter mode, you hit the hole to the ball. <laughs> um, can you have the hole spit the ball back out? Yeah, I mean, and originally, again, this was a, this was for a pinball game. This was a kick out hole for the pinball game. And the idea was you'd get the ball in there, you know, the the, the machine would go bing, 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 and then eject the, the ball again, book, um, so, so that you could continue play. That, that was the original idea. You could do that here, although that doesn't really have a place in mini putt. Okay, what we need to do now is we have to get, uh, we have to be able to hit the ball around. So let's work on that. So we're having to do some coding for it at this point. Um, we could add the script to the ball, but I don't think that's what we wanna do. I think, oh, there is one other thing we're going to want. Um, and this has to do with interacting with the Unity system. This is a lesson I learned after like ripping my hair out trying to figure out my pinball game. Unity has certain limits on how fast things can move, but also how fast they can spin. And um, the cap, specifically the cap on spinning for the physics system is too low for, well, certainly for pinball, uh, but presumably also for golf for the physics to work properly. What happens, the ball doesn't spin enough, so it ends up like just mostly sliding across the surface instead of rolling across it, which is obviously not what we want. So I do want to add a small script to the ball to get it to um, remove its limitation on how fast it can spin. In, like by default, it's a smart thing to have in, in, you know, in your game design, uh, in, in Unity by default, to prevent the physics from going completely bananas. But here we wanna be able to be fairly aggro with the physics. So we're gonna add a component to our ball um, and it'll be something like uncap physics uh, speeds. I don't know, something generic like that. I mean, we could have just a, a script for ball, but we might want to use this behavior on something else. So all we're going to do is for this, we are going to find our rigid body, um, which technically, because rigid body is a fairly common thing, we can just access it, you know, directly. But I'm going to do a little get component uh, rigid body check over here. I mean, I guess I could do a requirement. I was going to do something like if RB equals null um, debug log error. We'll just catch like if we as humans did something dumb. Um, no rigid body found on uh, game object dot name or something like that. And we'll just return. But then all we're gonna do is this, there is, is it's called max, yeah, max angular velocity. 
Um, yeah, I was gonna say, it has a default of seven, and I don't know what seven it really represents in the angular velocity, but I can tell you it's way too freaking low to do what we want. Um, in, in When we're doing the pinball game, if you get like the table and you slant it, um, although instead of slanting it, what we did is actually just change the gravity vector. That way you don't have to work with like a, a, a whole model that's tilted all the time, which is a pain. Um, but the ball starts rolling and then it just, it just never accelerates in rolling. It's almost like it's pushing against molasses because it's not allowed to start spinning faster and faster. And if you whack it hard enough, it'll just skid across the tabletop instead of rolling across it. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna set this to infinity and beyond, um, just to make sure that it's got no limit on this. And for our purposes, it's gonna be okay. Uh, we don't need an update at all. In fact, if you really wanna clean things up, you could do something like uh, destroy this. So this script will remove itself after it's done running, just to remove any possible overhead of its existence. Since it doesn't have an update routine, I don't think there's truly gonna be any overhead on this, but technically the script doesn't need to stay on the object after it's done its job. So we'll do this. Doc says radians per second. For seven, you get about one rotation per second. Yeah, so one rotation per second is not fast enough at all. So we do this, now the ball can spin at any speed. We're still probably going to want to tweak maybe some physics materials to affect the bounce, maybe some of the friction uh, dynamics, um, but uh, this was the big thing that'll make it feel pretty realistic. Okay, next thing I want to do, so we want to be able to whack the ball. So in golf, every whack of the ball is called a stroke. So between ball, hole, and stroke, we have a lot of potential for dirty uh, wordplay here, but <clears throat> we're, we're gonna be grown-ups, right? I think, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a stroke manager. Um, Rather than clutter the ball with a bunch of logic, I think it makes more sense to do this and have the stroke manager be aware of, you know, what your ball is and then apply things that way. I don't know. Something like that. Uh, we may want to subdivide it even more. I, I, it's, it is really nice to try to avoid big monolithic scripts if you can, so try to break it down. But the idea is we're going to have something like game object player ball. Um, that we will, you know, somehow find or something like this. And there, there might be a multiplayer thing. What if there's a scenario where we have multiple balls? I don't know, but there's gonna be something like that. And then we're gonna have some sort of, um, some sort of logic in here for handling the, the input. Um, we clearly are gonna wanna be able to provide the ball with um, direction and power, some sort of ability for the player to affect that. But in our first test version, what I'm gonna do, um, actually, do we even want the game object? We might wanna store the rigid body for it. Monster, both. That's ah, stupid. <clears throat> let's just let's just move on for now. We'll figure out a way to, to keep it clean later on. Um, a lot cleaner than the stream is. Hey, um, so I'm gonna do a really simple dummy thing here, which is we're just gonna check if we hit the space bar, we're just gonna go and push nut the ball and make sure that that part works, and we'll iterate over that. So um, we'll just do something like if input dot get key up uh, key code dot space bar. Let's do this for now. Um, whacka the ball is what we're gonna do. So um, our player ball dot rigid body. Yeah, I guess it, I may, maybe wanna store that. Let's just do this. Cause we can get the um, we can get the game object from the rigid body really easily. So we're gonna do this and we're going to add some sort of force to this object. Um, so I'll just set the, for now we'll do, stop, there we go. Uh, vector three, force vec equals new, vector three. Um, I'm trying to remember in Unity, Z would be into the camera or vice versa. I don't know. We'll do this and, and see what happens. We'll just give it a force of 10. I don't know. Just try to get a vague feel for it. So we're going to add a force to the ball on that. Um, I guess we want impulse, don't we? For the force mode. Uh which best represents like a single instant hit. The the numbers that you're gonna be passing into this vector are, are gonna be slightly different if you're on the default. And what's the default force mode? If you don't do anything, it's implied to be 
well, just dot force. Um, because by default, like the numbers with the dot force, which is default, it's sort of, if you're adding a force like frame to frame to frame, as opposed to just being a one shot over here. Um, one thing is normally you don't want to do changes in the physics system on update because update runs on every, on every frame in, in terms of every actual frame, every refresh of your monitor, basically whatever. We're not going to get into frame rates, but it happens there. This is different from the sort of fixed tick rate of the physics engine. The physics engine is operating at a in, a in a way that's disconnected from the visual frame rate and things like this, because your frame rate can go very slow or very fast or things like that. And you know, with delta times and things like that, you can, you can balance it out, but you're still not supposed to make changes to the physics engine um, outside of the... Um, outside of the fixed update, because that's the only when it happens, technically speaking. Um, if your update here, let's say your, your game's running, you know, like my monitor's got 144 hertz refresh rate. And if you turn off VSync, you could run even faster. This thing, this game here, it's so simple so far, it could run at a thousand frames a second. And so you could be trying to apply a lot of things to the physics system, but it's only when the physics system is doing an update, which by default is one every 50 or 50 times a second, um, that it will actually take effect. So generally speaking, you want to make changes to the physics system in fixed update. You know, everyone knows this. But on the flip side, what you don't want to do is you don't want to read inputs in fixed update because fixed update doesn't run on every true, like on every effective frame of the actual game. It's only running on every physics tick. So it's entirely possible you could miss some of these inputs, key up, key down, on a fixed update check. So really the best way to do this, the correct way, the correctest way maybe, uh, to do this is actually to use both update and fixed update. Because this runs once per visual frame. Use this for inputs. Um, and then fixed update runs on every tick of the physics physics engine use this for manipulation this is sort of correct and then what you, you tend to do is you might set a flag like we could do something like in the input do this have a boolean here uh do whack which is set to false i mean all this is going to go away later but you know for the sake of argument so if you hit the space bar we set do whack to be true and then in fixed update, we do if do whack. Oh, I was hoping it would fix our uh, indentation there. I think there's a hotkey for it, but there we are. There you go. If do whack, whack at a ball, set this back to false, do that. Um, this is a little overwrought for what we're doing here, but it's it's a thing, it, you will run into issues, you will run into very weird and hard to debug issues if you are doing your inputs and your physics in the same update, whether that's update or fixed update, whichever one of the two you use, if you're doing both the inputs and the, the physics in the same one, one thing or another will sometimes go wrong in a weird that, a way that's really hard to reproduce and track down. So one of those things to try to keep in mind. <laughs> I'll time debugging, trying to figure out why my input keys only work sometimes before I realize they were in fixed update. Yeah, and you can hide the problem. If in fixed update you're doing, if you're checking input dot um, get key for something, this will work fine in get fixed input because all this does is return true or false if you're currently holding down the key. But get key up and get key down only returns true if the key was pushed down or released on this frame. And by that, I mean this visual frame as opposed to a physics frame. So it's on the get key ups and get key downs that you get totally borked if you do it inside a fixed update. So anyway, we do this, done that. All right. So um, what I'm going to do, so the player ball over here, we're going to do a thing. Are we just going to find it? Yeah, we'll, we'll figure, again, then we might clean this up and do things in a different way. Uh, find player ball. Um, so what we're gonna do is game object dot find object with tag. 
um, where the tag is player. This slow and dumb and could do badness. I really don't like finding objects with tags. Um, because it's a string and you could forget to put set a, you know, did you remember to set the tag on the ball? Did you remember to set it on the prefab? Because otherwise, when you drag the next prefab in here, it may not have the tag for you to find it. I actually really tend to like having a unique component on my object and searching for something with the component because the prefab will have it and presumably the component will need to have it. Like if we had a script on here that was just called, you know, it was just, uh, oh, sorry, create a new script called ball, right? If we do this, um, then what you could do instead is game object dot find uh, object of type ball. What's nice about this is it also confirms the compile time. Like what if I made a mistake? What if I made a typo here, right? If I make a typo here, and then I'm in a situation of like, well, why is it never finding my freaking object? Why is this not being set correctly? What's going on? Typos in a string is really hard to find. Whereas if I do this, that's not gonna compile because this doesn't exist. And the, the compiler is gonna be like, whoa, 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 you've got an error on this line. So I like to move things towards a place where, uh, like I don't trust myself. So try to make things impossible to F up, for example. So we could go and do something like this. Um, the interesting thing about this is by sort of looking for objects and thinking about objects in terms of a ball is an object that has a ball component on it. This is actually sort of leads you into the, um, the uh, I was gonna say Unity component system. That's not the word I'm looking for. Um, the, 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 new, the new system that they introduced a year or two ago that's really fast for processing a lot of objects simultaneously. It works with threading, the job system, um, the something component, ECS, thank you, entity component system. It's like, not unity component system, what is it? The entity component system is effectively works not with this, the implementation isn't the same. You're not adding components to a game object, but the way it works is the same sort of logic. You, you filter and organize things based on what components the entity has. And you run scripts of like, I wanna run this function on all entities that have these three components on it. If, you, if an entity has these three components on it, this function is gonna run every frame like that. And it does it in a really fast and optimized way. So I like doing this sort of thing. And, it, and that's the thing. So in this situation, and again, finding something by name, which is also possible, right? You can find an object based on its name, um, is also sketchy for the same reasons as above, um, right? Find, find an object called ball. This is particularly bad and annoying because I believe this can only ever return one. I don't think there's a find, find several, is there? No, what's nice about, and you can do it with tags, so you can find objects with tag, or find objects of type. Uh, it can return an array, as opposed to just the first one it finds, which isn't always what you want. For our purposes here, I think we'll just go with that, and, and we'll see if we can find a better way to organize, especially when you start thinking, what if there's multiple players and things like that? We'll clearly need a better, a better and smarter system, but for now, we'll call that good enough. So game object uh, geo is equal to this. Um, am I covering any of the code with my head? I think we're okay, right? No, well, we're okay right now. Um, so we want to set player ball RB is equal to this dot get component uh, rigid body like so. Uh, you might want to do like if geo equals null debug dot log error couldn't find the ball. And then you actually might also want to do another one, you know, in case it just in case something dumb is going on. Um, uh, if player ball RB is equal to null, debug.log error, ball has no rigid body. Let you know that you've done the dumb. But in theory, then we've got stuff. So if we get here, uh, we can do a thing like, uh, we might want to do a check like if uh, player ball rigid body is equal to null, we might just want to return. This might not be an error. Might not be an error. Uh, maybe the ball is, fell 
out of bounds got deleted um, and hasn't respawned yet, right? We don't want to do uh, the fixed update. We don't want it to run if the ball doesn't exist, but we don't necessarily want to throw up an error if it doesn't, because there might be a legitimate reason for it, depending on how we do our game. I don't know. We'll see. Um, actually, and that might be a good example of code that we could actually add to the ball. What happens if it falls out of bounds, right? What if it hits a ramp? We hit it hard, it hits a ramp, flies out of bounds of our little level over here. We could have the ball check to see if it's fallen below a certain level. You know, if it's hit like, you know, negative five on the y-axis, then clearly it's, you know, maybe fallen out of bounds. I think the right thing to do, though, is probably to have some sort of, um, uh, what am I looking for in here? Sprites. Is it not on here? Okay, over here then. 3D object, uh, plane. Ground plane. Uh, have it just below here, um, so it doesn't clip in. Uh, minus 0 0.01 or something like that. And then put a, um, a collision uh, logic on this. Here, we can have this be huge. Have a collision logic on this where if the ball hits this, then clearly it must have gone out of bounds and we should do a thing with it. Uh, we'll leave it be for now. I'll do, um, just because it's looking butt ugly here. Let's create, well, it's still going to look butt ugly, but less overwhelming. Um, brown material. I'm just going to make it brown. There you go. Just that it doesn't hurt my eyes quite as much. These white walls are still driving me crazy. And it's funny in isometric view how, like, wrong and terrible this looks, but there you go. Look at that. Okay. So, in theory, if we hit play, the stroke manager should hopefully find the ball. And if I hit the space bar, do I think it's true? Let's make sure this is working. And do whack, player ball, add force. Debug.log. Whacking it. Prone dirt, so much realism. Uh, whack it goes, but fixed update does not. Oh. Mm. When you write a function, make sure you call the function. Or weird things will happen. Hey! Hey? Do I not have colliders on the walls? I thought I did. Yes. Why'd you go through? The, how'd you go through the wall? Heat into the sun. <laughs> we do need a little drag on this. It may, I mean, it may have just been going too fast. Oh, uh, we probably have to enable some dynamic collision modes on this bad boy. Do, 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 uh, mesh render, rigid body, uh, there we go. We want, um, continuous, continuous dynamic doesn't really have to happen. So, let's, let's see, let's, if I just set it to continuous, and let's go back over here and set it to 10 again. Is you gonna go through the wall? There we go, you didn't, okay. So what's the deal with the collision detection mode over here? Um, you can read about it in the help for full things, but basically um, this has to do with when something is moving so fast where on one frame, so let's say this is my solid object and my ball is here. And on one frame it's here, but it's moving so fast that on the next frame it's over here. 
on the de the discrete collision detection, it may not notice that. It will only notice if on a frame it ends up like being sort of clipped into this. Then it will correctly figure out, oh, okay, there must have been a collision and blah, 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 blah. Um, with the continuous, what it does is a little bit smarter um, about um, not clipping through things. Um, when you're talking about a collision with something that is static, like if you have one, one dynamic object and one static object, uh, as far as I know, continuous is going to be everything you need to handle that properly. When you're concerned about multiple moving objects, multiple dynamic objects that may or may not be moving quickly, um, and you're worried about them, you know, their interconnections not being uh, looked at as much, those are the other moves. Speculative is new. I'm not used to seeing that. Um, but I think we're going to be okay with just this. The other thing you can do is if you are running a game that is heavily reliant on physics, has relatively fast moving objects, and you need a lot of accuracy, you can change the physics tick of the engine over here. Um, I think... Oh, no, it's not here. It's in time, isn't it? Yeah, which has always kind of annoyed me. It's like you're trying to change the physics tick. You would think it's in the physics tab. No, it's in the time tab. This fixed time step, this determines how many times uh, per second or how much time in between ticks of the physics engine there is. So by default, it's got a 0.02 second, so it runs 50 times a second. Um, you could do something like this, and so now it runs 100 times a second. And keep in mind, the physics system tick rate is different from the visual tick rate. Um, in theory, it will be truly fixed at that. It's fixed-ish. Um, if the physics uh, system runs too slow for some reason, it can start skipping some of these. Um, but you can turn this up a little bit, and it'll give you a little bit more accuracy and things. I think for us, mostly because we're not going to have... Uh, the objects aren't going to move that fast, um, and there's not that many dynamic things. It's a real problem in the pinball game because... Um, in pinball, it's a fairly small environment, but the balls go really fast. And the bigger problem was in the pinball thing um, is the ball has to collide with other dynamic elements, mostly the flipper. Uh, I was using an actual physics, like using the physics system to run the flipper and the flipper flips super fast. And it's also impacting another ball that could be hitting super fast. So it needed a really aggressive um, time step in here. That's not going to be the case in here because we're not going to use a physics um, putter. What we're doing here by adding force directly to it, this is exactly how the putting will work in this game. Um, and as such, it, it's not going to be a concern. We don't have to mess with that at all. But yeah, when we're doing the pinball game, it's like we really push the physics system to its extreme. Uh, is it a good idea to make your wall colliders much thicker since there's nothing outside them? Um, it might be. The other thing that you can do, um, rather than, you know, trying to figure out how thick the wall collider should be and all these different kind of things, um, is you could uh, get better, faster operating collision behavior if instead of using a mesh collider, which we're using here, use a series of box colliders or other primitives. Um, so what you could do here is like not use this mesh collider and instead uh, you're going to want like a series of empties that have box colliders on them. Uh, where is you? And then you're going to want to go, go and position these um, like manually sort of in line with stuff. Because what happens, box colliders, box colliders, sphere colliders, um, something else colliders, I guess capsule colliders, um, because they are predictable physical objects, they, um, the, the code to run them is much, it runs really fast and it's much more accurate and much more bulletproof than, um, mesh colliders. The downside is that you would be, you'd be creating a series of these by hand. Um, and having to hand place them. But what you would have, and this might be good if you're looking into development for mobile stuff, um, because even though you're gonna end up with more colliders here, these will run a lot faster and be much more consistent and bulletproof. And you can set up these invisible colliders that are you know, much bigger and wider. And hell, you can have them be much taller as well to minimize the chance of the ball going outside the bounds. Hell, you could have non-visible walls if you wanted to for some reason and do that sort of stuff. Um, so these are very performant and they're a great way to uh, do a variety of different optimizations. But for our purposes, this mesh collider can be fine. And yeah, the other thing we can do is we can declare that this level here is static. By setting the static flag, 
a number of different optimizations occur. Um, the lighting engine um, and the physics engine both uh, get dramatically optimized in a variety of different ways. If we tell the system, this object will never move. It is fixed in place um, and that can, that can do a, a big differences for you. So using that static tag is really handy, both for lighting and for the, um, the physics. And yeah, our, uh, our shadows over here are detached um, from things. We need to tweak the, uh, the shadow bias uh, over here. This bias is a bit of a hint uh, that kind of comes into play about like distances. Um, there, I think there's a couple of different ways that we can adjust to make the shadows actually work better. Um, it has to do with the, um, with shadows, the amount of sort of like graphical memory and processing for a shadow on a large object as opposed to very fine objects is a very, very different. If you, if you optimize the shadows to be able to deal with very fine objects, we, but you're in a world with many, with big objects, you're just going to slow down the game like crazy um, for calculating that. So, I mean, we'll have to mess with some of these, some of the strength and planes and, and whatever to, to get the shadow to show up properly over here. But that's probably outside the scope of this. All right, we got that. Let's, um, I was hoping to get a little bit more done by now. What I want to do is I want to work out the input for our, our ball controller over here because we want to be able to, you know, not just hit space bar and have the ball go straight, right, which is still constrained by the wall, but we want to be able to aim and whatnot. So um, I think what we want to do is we want to have some sort of arrow we can steer. And then presumably when you hit space bar, maybe we have like the power meter that goes up and then down and you, you hit the space bar a second time to, to lock in on a certain place. And that's pretty typical, right? Increase the camera near clipping plane to fix those. Uh, is it the camera or is it the, like, is it the near plane over here? Or the camera clipping, but I don't, because there's the, there's the near clipping plane for this, but does it affect the shadows? I mean, it's pretty near, like, yeah, I was gonna say, I don't think that's gonna have any impact on that. We do want a fairly close clipping plane. In fact, we really don't need a very distant clipping plane. We can set it to like a hundred meters because we're never looking at things very far away. But okay, we can we can mess with the shadows forever. Let's let's move on to the game here. So let's get a sort of arrow. I think what I'm going to do do I want it a 3D object or texture on a plane? In in a sense, it doesn't matter because even a texture on a plane, the plane's a three D object, and that's going to think that's going to be scaled. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Blender, uh, new file, um, yeah, don't save anything, and I'm going to make a cube. I'm going to go into the edit mode for the cube. Uh, I'm going to hit G to move it. Y along that axis, minus one. So I'm going to back it up, but I'm going to leave the origin point here. And the reason for that is when we scale it inside of Unity, it'll do this. So this, okay, nice wraparound. But hang on, let me, let me, let me complete this so that you, 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 can, you can pick up what I'm putting down. I'm going to add a new object. I'm going to add a cube. Um, I'm going to go into edit mode here. I'm going to G, Y, one, line it up that way. Um, go to wireframe mode. Uh, I want to scale you along the X, say like this. Then I'm going to grab the top bits over here and scale them uh, on the X this way. Actually, I guess I want to merge these. So if I deselect everything, if I grab you, um, there's a hotkey for it too, but yeah, just mesh merge, uh, at center, mesh merge at center. There we go. So now we're going to have a little 3d arrow ready to go in here. So let's save this, uh, come down here, um, 3d arrow, save. Done, done, done. That's going to get imported. So the idea is going to be, if we drag this in, I don't guess it's huge, but we need that. Um, what I want to do is I want to create an empty and put it inside of here. Always, and I've, I've talked about this before, you never want your model to be like sort of on its own because what you want to be able to do is make changes to this model um, that 
won't get broken. Like for scaling in particular here, for example, my game object, I want to wrap this. I want to scale down this arrow. Um, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Probably smaller than that. Okay, that's not too bad. Um, but see my base game object here, so with our um, 3D arrow or something like that. Um, let me just reset this over here. Oh, no, that's not actually what I want to do. This thing is still at a scale of 1 which just keeps things cleaner. So it's sort of like wrap things in a game object like that. It'll be a lot neater. Plus, if you want to add any code to this, do it on the empty game object as opposed to the model. Because if you decide to like, let's say we, we draw a completely new model, right? In, um, in Blender, then we want to be able to like delete this, drag in the new model instead, but then all of our code, all of our components will still have existed on the base object here and be untouched. Um, what I'll probably do as well is rotate this a hundred. Bah. Oh, rotate, not position. Shut up. You guys saw nothing. Um, so that it sort of by default points in the way I want. The other thing that's nice, make sure your model is at zero, zero, zero inside of the, um, the game object over there. So the idea is when you're putting, this thing is going to come up. And then when you are powering up, I'm probably going to scale this thing. Uh, nope, not this thing. This thing up in the Y. We'll do some sort of positioning tricks or something like that to show intensity. Uh, maybe not. Maybe I was going to talk about doing scaling tricks with this to show intensity, but I think that would look kind of dumb and not what we want. Um, I think we'll have the power meter instead. Although you could also do... Um, you could, as an alternative to your control, instead of being like spacebar to activate the power meter, you could do a thing where you are clicking and dragging the like arrow, right? For the direction, click on the ball, drag out, release, and then the ball sends out that way. There's no reason you couldn't do your input that way as well. Um, also, that would work fairly well on mobile, or would it though? I mean, it would be work well on mobile if your view was here, but the problem is if you're zooming out to see the whole course, the click and drag, would that be awkward or not? I don't know. Whereas on mobile, what you could have is like like arrows, you know, rotate right, rotate left, rotate right, rotate left. Okay, hit it and hit it at that power. I think that input would be a little easier on mobile. Replace the ball with a small dog near there. Wait, what? Texture in the arrow is a power meter. That could be cool. You could have it glow. You could have it do all kinds of different things. Um, uh, you might want like a little idle animation for the arrow. Like it's sort of just whoop, whoop whoop as it's waiting, you know, just to get your attention. There's all sorts of different ways you could you could do that. But we want this thing to be demonstrating a sort of direction. And this is the other incentive to having things sort of locked in on one another. What we can do here, ideally, I would like to be able to rotate this object, but instead of having it rotate on its center, what I would like it to do is I would like it to rotate sort of orbit around the ball. So here's what I'm gonna do. Um, just for now, I'm going to take the 3D arrow, I'm going to put it inside the ball, and just set the arrow's position to 0, 0, 0. That way, the origin of this 3D arrow game object is centered here. I'm just going to, again, pop it out of the, uh, the um, hierarchy again. Then I'm going to take my model, and I'm going to offset the model over to something like this. Then, if I go back to my game object, and I rotate... Huh? Right? That's all right. To show direction, I like it. So we're gonna go back to the stroke manager at this point. So the stroke manager is going to want um, to know about this arrow because it's gonna be responsible. Like we're gonna have in here, we're gonna have a float for stroke angle. And then we're gonna have a public game object um, for stroke angle indicator. Something like that. I don't know. Boom, and put it in there. Now, I guess one of the things at this point is the, um, that's a good question. Um, do we want the stroke manager to actually be responsible for rotating this thing? I think no. I think what we're gonna do 
is on the 3D arrow, which I'm going to rename to stroke angle indicator, because that seems pretty smart. I'm going to add a component to it called stroke angle indicator. And what we're going to have is we're on this, we're going to have a, a public function called um, set stroke angle. And it's going to take in a float with an angle. And that is that. And so over here in the stroke manager, instead of a generic game object, we're going to know it's going to be a stroke angle indicator. Um, over here, we can do something like stroke angle indicator is equal to uh, game object dot find object of type. Whoops. Find object of type. So it's going to find an object. Well, actually, it's going to find a component of this. It's going to return the first one it finds. If for some reason we had one more than one of these in the scene, it would return the first one. I don't know why we'd have more than one in the scene. We'll do that. We'll save this. And on update, so in here, we are going to have some sort of, if true, or something like that, uh, update angle. Angle equals, whoops. What's it called? Oh, stroke angle, um, which shouldn't be capitalized because it's private. There you go, lowercase. Um, stroke angle will be set to something. I'm just going to force it to 45 degrees, just to say. Um, and then what we're going to do is our stroke angle indicator, we are going to call uh, set stroke angle and pass it. So we just need to let this thing know hey, the angle has changed. The alternative is the stroke manager, the stroke angle could be public and the stroke angle indicator could just check it every frame to see what the angle is. Actually, that's probably cleaner. You know what, I like this. F this, F that, do this, have this be public, um, get and a protected set. Yeah, I like that. Do we need the semicolon there? No, there you go. So stroke angle can now be accessed from outside of stroke manager, but can't be changed. I like that. Done. Um, tell you what, uh, if uh, input dot um, get access, actually not even get access, what we're gonna do is Input dot get access horizontal. Looking forward to a new input manager that's going to be added into Unity here soon. They've been previewing it. Um, I don't know, probably like some sort of multiplier times time dot delta time. So there we go. So by default, the horizontal axis is the left and right arrow key. I believe A and D as well. Or if you have a joystick, um, you can do that. And actually, uh, we can have input dot get button fire. I think is a default button that exists, which is mapped to spacebar, but we can do that. And the nice thing is that we're all set up to use a controller instead. Woo, okay, done, done, done. So the stroke angle indicator, so we're gonna be doing it differently. It's gonna know about stroke manager. So it's gonna be responsible for finding, whoops, whoops, what? Okay. Game object, it's gonna be responsible for finding the manager. And rather than having a public stroke angle, what it's going to do is every round, it's going to set itself. Uh, this dot transform dot uh, rotation is going to be equal to a quaternion dot Euler zero. Yeah, Y axis um, where it's getting this part stroke manager dot stroke angle zero. So every every frame, it's just going to rotate itself to match this. The other thing it's probably going to want to do is track like the player ball. So in the same way we've got our, um, our this sort of fine player ball. Actually, maybe we can do is um, make this visible as well. I don't know. I'm not sure what we how we want to manage it, but um, transform player ball transform, uh, transform. So if 
find the thing called player, save that. This, like, fix me. This is prone to all kinds of things and weirdness, and if a ball despawns, then all of a sudden the transform will become a null for whatever reason, but it's going to be okay. What we're going to do is we're going to set um, this.transform.position is going to be set to the player ball transform dot position. So we're going to stay, we're going to be lined up with the player ball at all times and then rotated based on the stroke angle. So I can take the, uh, the stroke angle indicator and put it anywhere. So if I put it over here and hit play, there you go. It's going to go and set itself there, but apparently we don't have an input for fire. Okay. They may have changed some of the defaults. They haven't changed the, uh, the, to the new input manager yet. Oh, it's called fire one which is left control. Oh, was jump ma map to space? Yeah, okay, well, let's um, delete. I mean, we could mostly just clean this out. Uh, literally three axes. Actually, really only need two. We just need horizontal and fire. So we'll just call this fire. And uh, space. Excellent. If I hit left and right. Oh, it's way too slow. Oh, hold on. <clears throat> I don't have the... Uh... Oh, when I clicked it. Um... The focus wasn't set in the right place. Fire. I don't want to fire on the mouse button anymore. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, the rotation's way too slow. Oh! I'm setting the rotation to this... Uh, no, not here. Yeah, I'm setting the rotation to the input as opposed to modifying the rotation or modifying the angle by the input. There needs a little bit of plus there. Hey, there we go. That's too slow. So we're just going to, I don't know, by 100? It's probably going to be too fast, but let's see. Oh, that's not bad, actually. I like it. Now, the input has a little bit of gravity to it. So even after I let go, it takes a second, well, not a literal second, but it takes a moment for it to come to a halt. And that's because of the gravity and sensitivity. Um, Cause this is basically simulating a joystick and the idea being, if you let go of the button, it takes a second to go back in. A thousand is pretty strong though, isn't it? I would have thought that would have been, that would have felt like instant. Oh, mm. not the fire axis, it's horizontal. There we go, I was gonna say, the horizontal axis had a really low sensitivity and gravity. Um, like, even like 100 is probably all you need, but I'm gonna just reset these to 1,000. 1,000, it's gonna be basically instant, where the second you let go, it's gonna drop down to zero again. There you go. Although there, there was something kind of nice and organic by the other way. One of the things you could do is, while you probably want gravity maxed out, you might want to keep the sensitivity, in fact, quite low. So there's a bit of a ramp up so that if you just if you just tap, it'll move just barely because it will take a moment to come up to its full strength. There you go. See how it like ramps up? So you can do very fine tuned control or hold it for just getting around faster. That might be good. The other thing you could do is maybe modifier keys. So if you hold like shift, then it'll move very slowly for fine tuning. Something like that. Yeah, I guess you could use get axis raw, but I, I, I like getting the axis and then being able to tune some of that a little bit here. But yeah, get axis raw will ignore the gravity and sensitivity. You're absolutely right there, but I don't know. There might be some value from this. I don't know. I don't know, you know? Anyway, okay. So now in our stroke manager, we have an angle, which means when we whack it over here, we can rotate this vector. Um... Multiply it by quaternion dot uh, Euler 
zero, stroke angle, zero. Oh, wait. You always put the, uh, the quaternion first. So now, if I just hit space, okay, you go straight. If I go and do this, you go that way. Um, that feels, like, really strong. I mean, obviously, we still need our meter, but, like, I think it's telling us that, like, 10 is, like, way stronger than we're going to want for our max, I think, for a mini putt. Out of 5, five's still pretty goddamn fast. We also don't have much of a bounce going on here. Unless I'm doing something wrong and it's not applying. We don't need a time delta time in here. There you go. I say, like, that... The one still feels... That feels pretty good. Obviously, we need to do something about this lack of bounce. And potentially some friction and things like that. Um, so, we have angular drag. I don't think we need... Well, we might want some actual drag, yeah. Uh, if we copy this in here, first of all, let's see how that feels. So that will dramatically change how much force it feels we need to do stuff. Okay, I mean, we're not really seeing the slowdown. But in theory, it's happening some. Um, the big thing, and ignore the mass. The mass is, is just fuzzy. It's, it's mostly relative mass for things. Um, so there's no, there's no necessarily accuracy of anything in there. Why not time delta time? Um, because it's just a fix. When we hit it, we're hitting it, 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 there's a fixed force being added to it as a single impulse. It's a one time, boom, we're applying X amount of force. There's no, there's no logic to time delta time here. Um, the motion of this, like if we were running the update to actually change the position based on the velocity, then we'd do that. But the velocity is being handled inside of the physics engine. Anyway, I think that's okay. But yeah, this lack of bounce is the poop. So what do we want to do about that? Well, for that, we want a physics material. So um, in the collider itself, there's a slot for a physics material here. Um, by default, nothing has anything in there. And instead, what there is, in a project setting, if, if the physics material on a collider isn't set, it's instead going to use the default physics material from this window, which is currently blank, um, but it still has values. If we go over here, we can create a uh, physics material down here. So I believe these defaults, 0 0.6, 0 0.60 bounciness, I believe this is exactly what you get if, you know, if everything is empty. So what we really need to do is just add in some bounciness. Now, technically, we only have to add it to the ball itself, but we could replace the default physics material as well, um, you know, if everything wants to interact that way. I think what I'll do is I'll just um, I'll call this ball fizz map. I'll just add this to the ball itself. And the big thing is we need to go and add in some amount of bounciness. How much? I don't know. Let's find out. Um, and yeah, the actual bounce in the end is going to be an average between the bounciness of the two objects involved in the collision. So if our bounciness is 0.5 and we're colliding, colliding at something with a zero bounciness, then it'll be 0.25. Um, which is fine, because we could just we could just keep tuning this number. I guess one is the maximum uh, to end up with something. But in a sense, the walls are bouncy. The balls are not perfectly absorbent things. Um, in a sense, everything in the system has the same amount of, of, of bounce. So I think in practice, what we're going to do, just because it'll simplify some of the comparison math, is I'm just going to set this to the, I'll just have default fizzmat here, and I'm just going to add that in. We could, if we, if for some reason we get in a situation where we have some objects that are supposed to bounce one way versus another, like if there's debris or something like that, then we might end up splitting this down. But for now we can do that and then we don't have to worry about remembering to, you know, if it's been added or whatever. We'll just do this and we'll just add some bounce to the world. So let's say 0.5. So everything has 0.5 bounciness. Let's hit play. I should have aimed at a wall, but okay. That's not bad. You're, you're still moving surprisingly much. I think what we need, it's not so much the, um, we don't really need a, that much drag. So drag is basically like air resistance that's going to slow down the ball. That's not really where most of it's going to come from. It's probably we need a little less angular drag 
because it needs to like stop rolling as much. Let's set it to something crazy, like 0.5, just to dramatically increase the amount. Why did you stop dead on the wall? I thought it was okay. Oops. This grass is fairly, should be fairly slowy. Let's go ahead and give it some more, just actual drag and see what happens. We could also just increase the friction between them. I don't think that's what we need to worry about. I'm just surprised how much drag it's actually needing to sort of feel right. But I think it's because the default mass and scale, it's assuming that this is sort of denser and just generally heavier than it is and not as affected by stuff. Actually, I think I realize why it doesn't feel right. Because the ground, our ground here is flat. Whereas in actuality, this would be rolling on a very uneven um, surface, right? Which I think would sap effectively at low speeds. It would effectively add quite a bit of drag to it. I think like that's why I feel like we're putting in an unrealistic amount of drag here in terms of like if this was rolling on a flat surface, that behavior that we're seeing is mostly right. But it, because we're not, we have to artificially add in a lot more drag. Yeah, that feels better. Although it really, it feels like when it gets, we may want to have it stop sooner. I think that might be it. Rather than rolling at very low speeds, because of the bumpy surface, what actually happens when the ball gets quite slow, it almost can't like, make uphill because what what it is the bumpy surface is like a series of hills when you're going fast you're just sort of skipping across the top that's fine when you're going really slow you sort of dip into a valley and then can't quite make it uphill i think more than adding drag we mostly just want the ball to stop um when it reaches a certain minimum speed and just like hit the brakes at that point i think that behavior would end up feel correct more correct Um, and also, what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to bring down the angular drag again to its original default. I'm just going to use just straight out drag, I think. Yeah. There we go. That's feeling okay. I think overall that feels much better. Um, but yeah, we might go and add in we've got a ball script over here that we we're just using it as an example for something but i think um it's a rigid body I'm trying to remember there is sleep speeds and things you can set Sleep threshold. Mass normalized energy threshold below which objects start going to sleep. I think what we want to do is we want to increase that. The question is, I don't know what it is to start off with. So, I don't know. Debug.log. Show me the threshold. I'm search for friction uh, coefficients for grass. Okay. 0. 0.005. And I can't set that over here, can I? No. 
So 0 0.005 is what's already there. So let's set this to be 0 0.05. So, uh, theoretically, a much lower threshold of speed for it to stop. We actually might want to lower it even more than that. We might want to go quite... Yeah, it definitely stopped a little sooner. What if I did something like this? Would just feel like all of a sudden it stopped, like, inappropriately? All right, that, that I think is okay. It's interesting that it's bouncing in very different ways each time. Yeah, it really, it really is. Cause it ended up here this time. Now why is it ending up over here? Oh, der. Mm, yeah, sorry, it's in the fixed update because originally I was going to manually check it, but you're right, it doesn't have to be reset all the time. I don't think it was doing anything bad. Yeah, I felt kind of okay. Why are you changing your collision angle all the time? I think it has something to do with the friction um, as things collide. Yeah, I guess because it's spinning, that might be part of it. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of the English because of the spin. Which is probably okay. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it probably has to do with the uh, the friction, too. Um, and the... Um, and the drag. So, when we were doing the pinball game, for example, I think effectively the drag was basically nothing. Um, I think, like, the actual drag was effectively nothing. I think there was some angular drag in there that was being used. And uh, between the two of them, it can lead to some kind of somewhat bizarre interactions. And sometimes things can feel like too much English or not enough English. Oh, we'll do that. We can, like, micro that for, like, a million years, but that's not what we're here for. Okay, um, we got about 20 minutes left, and I think that's going to work out nicely for us to make a little power meter. I changed the density of air for more drag. <laughs> Again, we're using the drag to fake the uneven ground, which is neither friction nor drag. And at the And the amount of slowdown you get from going over the uneven ground is very changes dramatically on a curve based on the the, ball, the speed of the ball too but anyway um all right so we got that if i do this we can actually shoot that way well, maybe we need more bounce we need to be quite bouncy in fact the whole thing where it sticks there we go. That's much cleaner. Um, oh, the other thing, and I think this is in the physics system. That's right. There's something else in here. There is a bounce threshold. We want to bring the bounce threshold all the way down. Um, that's why when you end up with that sticking, it's because it's not. It, it, it wasn't high enough of a hit for it to trigger the bounce threshold, so the bounce was just ignored, so it just ends up just sticking to the side, which isn't what you want. So we probably don't need it to be as bouncy as long as the threshold is basically zero. There we go. That's good. He's stopping a little bit too soon now. I mean, it could be. It's always going to be a like, balance between how does the power feel versus what. That seems kind of okay to me. Remember, we're losing a lot of energy when we bounce as well, so that's part of it. We're going to call that close enough. Um, let's work on a little power meter. I think that's going to be UI element. I mean, it could be literally anything. Um, but let's say, so our stroke manager, we're going to have a stroke force. Okay, so there's a stroke angle. We're going to have stroke force in here. Um, and now finally, we're also going to have a, a bit of a mode selection. So we're going to have, uh, we're going to define an enum called 
Stroke mode, sure. Um, how do we, do we specialize like this? I always get the syntax confused. So basically there's two modes we're gonna be in. One, where the ball is, is still, and we're waiting for the player to, to whack it. And mode two is the ball is moving around. Um, and so no player input should be available. Because right now I can keep whacking space and it'll just keep hitting the ball as we go. Um, I mean, there could be a, ch a check for things. Um, so whether or not we actually need an enum versus a stat, a state check or whatever, there's lots of different ways you can think about it. There may only be two modes. There may only be the, the ready to whack and the we are currently rolling mode, but there could be others. I mean, maybe there's end up a third mode for when the ball is, is in the cup. Or maybe there's going to be another mode uh, for multiplayer, where what we're doing is waiting for another player or something. I don't know. Um, ready to whack versus ball is rolling. I don't know. Um, I kind of want it to be public, which means I sort of want it to be called like this. And again, because I want maybe other pieces of code. Um, I don't know if we want this internal or not, or we might, you know, have some sort of function call to check the state. I don't know. Let, let's assume we're just going to make it like visible here. But yeah, um, because of scope, I can't name these the same thing unless this is like stroke mode, enum. It's a little awkward. Uh, oops, protected set is actually how I want to write that. Oh, uh, public enum. There we go. I, I don't know if this is actually what we'd want, but just in the interest of moving forward for now. Uh, it's like, it what ends up being the cleanest code? <laughs> That's, you tend to refactor, but we're going to enter into the, like, the let them do our portion of, like, let's make sure we just keep this working. So, really, what we want is probably in fixed update is where we're going to check. Well, if, okay. Um... If stroke mode is equal to um, ball is rolling, nothing to do but wait for it to stop. So what we'll, pro we'll do is there'll be a planned return here, but I think it's going to be some sort of uh, check ball status or something or update. Yeah, update stroke mode. Right, so if the ball is rolling, we're gonna do this. And so all we're doing here is, is the ball still rolling? So if uh, player ball RB dot uh, is sleeping, then we can change the stroke mode. So if the ball is sleeping, I mean, the physics system is done, so it's not moving around, we can say, hey, we're ready to whack at this point. Check ball status. I'm going to have to check ball status. It, make sure to check ball status. You know, I want to make sure to catch your... Uh... Oh. Uh, you know, any any cancer as early as possible. Check that ball status. <laughs> this is a public service message. There you go. Is ball sleeping? That's basically it. I feel like update stroke mode is maybe the wrong name. But anyway, some, some sort of thing like that. Is the ball still rolling? If so, do that. Otherwise, nothing. Um... Because basically, after we whack it, what we're going to do is we're going to change the stroke mode to be ball is rolling. In a sense, I suppose what I could do is not do a check here. And an update stroke mode is, is sleeping. If so, set this mode. If it's not sleeping, then set a different mode. But I think this is going to be okay. And we're sort of building a state machine-ish kind of thing here. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. But there we go. So now, we can't actually whack it a ball if um, if it's rolling, because we're just going to uh, return over here. We can only whack at the ball when the ball is no longer rolling. Dun, 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 dun. Actually, I'm going to move this to up over here. Okay. Boom. Um, or what we could do is something, actually, maybe here. This would be better. If stroke mode not equals ready to whack, then process the stroke mode over here. There, that's, that's more sane. Because we only want to continue down here if the ball is whackable. These are technical golf terms. Shut up, I'm an awesome golfer. 
Uh, ba 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 ba. Okay, so that's one thing. Next thing, yeah, we're gonna do a little UI um, ification. Well, just as a test. If I hit play, I hit. If I space smar, nothing is happening. Okay, perfect, wonderful. So let's make a user interface. So UI. What we're gonna do is we're gonna be making an image. Uh, I mean, there'll probably be more than that to it. But for now, let's just do an image. So this is gonna be the uh, stroke force. And what we need is, yeah, right now it's just got a single plane rectangle, which is okay. We'll put it down on the, I don't know, the bottom right corner. Uh, we'll set the width to 20. Sure, that's fine. Um, we probably wanna have something inside of it. Let me duplicate this, put it inside. Um, this thing is actually going to be stretched to its parent, but with a two by two by two by two pixel border. Um, so, and this will change the background to black. So it'll be a nice little border. Um, oh, switch this to 2D mode. There you go. How come I can't actually see the black line over here? It's clearly within the... Um, the frame. I don't know. But I might want to just give it a little padding here. Um, minus two. So we might do like minus four. Minus four or plus four. There you go. So it's got a little bit of spacing in here. And then this stroke force here, we are going to be giving it a... What am I looking for here? Um, is it not just part of image? How do we get the slice? Oh, I don't remember. Is it masking? No. Oh, you know what? I need an actual sprite. I think. Let's make a... Um, we can just create a sprite here, right? If I just create a square... Um, stroke force... So now I have this. If I actually add an actual graphic to this. Ah, there we go. Image type. Lovely. So we want filled mode. That's what I'm looking for. Um, in vertical mode. Huh? Huh? There you go. So all we need to do to make this little stroke force graphic work is change the fill amount. So we're going to add a component. Stroke force UI. go open up so what it's gonna do it's gonna work a little like the stroke angle indicator first of all um, where it's gonna grab a copy of the stroke manager and once per frame all it's gonna do uh, so we need to use unity engine dot UI because we're gonna have to reference some UI -E things um, because we have an image component on ourselves so image uh, image So we're going to get our image component over here. And on every update, what we're going to do is we're going to set image dot, uh, what is that thing called? Fill amount. Fill amount to be equal to stroke manager. I was going to say strike force or stroke force, but not quite because this would be an absolute number. What we need this is as a percentage. So our stroke manager, we have our, this is our current stroke force, but what we kind of need is a max stroke force. This is as hard as we're allowed to hit a thing. Um, and what should this be? Well, let's come over here. So right now we're hitting it at one. If we were to hit it at five again, because we've, we've changed a lot of our of our numbers, right? So how would this compare? There you go, level one, thank you. So if I were to hit play here, and we still have to adjust the camera, but what? Input button submit is not set up. Oh, uh, let me disable the standard input module. There you go, get rid of that whining. If I hit you, uh, 
That doesn't feel very different from... That's 10... 50? So yeah, what I'm tracking here is what is the hardest, like, the hardest possible stroke... 50 seems like it might be a pretty... Did I double click this? Did it set do whack twice? Oh! Hmm. <clears throat> yeah. It, it loaded up two do acts in here. Um, oh, which is probably changing a button. That's why it was inconsistent. Yeah, because it wasn't every frame, and it's running very quickly right now, every frame that I had held the space bar down, it was whacking it more than once. So our numbers that we were checking before are going to be a bit different now. So now, if I hold down space, nothing happens. If I release space, it goes, and only the one time. Okay, that still feels like a pretty intense hit over there. I think I'm kind of okay with that. If I change the uh, the default angle... Um, just do this, leave it at zero. Boom. It does lose a lot of energy on the bounces. How do we feel about that? Um, I mean, I think it would be a good idea. I thought I'd set this to a higher number. Did I not set the bounciness up to like one at some point? Maybe I did it while the game was running. I mean, I think a one is a little much. We're going to do that. Let me uh, cut down the uh, force over here. Now that we've made a few tweaks. Let's set it to a 20. Yeah, there should be some loss. There's prob There might not be enough. Let's, um, 7.5 on the bounciness. And let me reset this to that. Okay, five's definitely not enough. 15. We may want the strongest stroke to be a little harder than the 15, but probably not much. Let's figure a 20. Okay, so what we want to do here is this is actually going to change to stroke force. And what we're going to do is we're going to set the max stroke force to be equal to uh, 20, just for the sake of argument. Um, we could, um, we could expose that, but I think what we're going to do is we're going to have a public float, uh, stroke force percentage, which is going to just have the get over here, no set. And all it's going to do is return stroke force divided by max stroke force. Oh, uh, return. There we go. So now our stroke force UI is just going to ask for the stroke force percentage, which is going to be a, the, a float that theoretically caps at one, unless we did something really weird. Um, so now if we do this, if I set this to say 15 for a second here, we should end up with a bar on the bottom right that's three quarters filled. Okay, so obviously what we're all what we're really going to want is this is going to start at a zero, which I mean it'll do by default if I don't fill anything in. Same thing with the stroke angle. We'll zero that out. That's going to be okay. Um, and so now the difference is when we hit the space bar here, it's not going to set do whack. It's instead going to start the power meter filling up or going down.
Yeah, that it does work to highlight a, a, a message if you you know want it to be more visible in general. But yeah, people have been putting it to pretty good use, which is nice. Um, so we're gonna want a stroke force fill speed. Um. How long should it take to go from the bottom to the top? A second? Two seconds? Let's set it to 10F. Um, and then we'll want um, uh, int uh, fill deer, uh, which is going to be a one for now. Two seconds. Yeah, maybe we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll we'll try it and see how it feels. This could be something we expose in the uh, the options as well to tweak. Although I guess that the fill speed is too slow, it makes it easier to get accurate amounts. Anyway, um, bull, I don't know, do fill. Although this could be uh, a mode, right? Actually, so can do whack. So. Um, Uh, right, so um, not sure. So I have stroke filling. Uh, actually, I guess our modes could be like aiming. Feeling, do whack, ball is rolling. Yes, I like that. If uh, stroke mode is equal to uh, aiming, then we are processing the changes to stroke angle. Um, also, if we're in aiming mode and we hit the fire button, what's going to happen is we're going to switch to stroke mode is equal to, um, filling. So if we hit the fire the first time, the meter starts to fill. If stroke mode... Uh, is equal to filling, then the um, stroke force stroke force plus equals stroke force fill speed times time dot delta time. So it's frame rate independent. If stroke force is greater than max stroke force, then we're going to set the stroke force to be equal to max stroke force. Um, and set the, oh, um, this times fill direction. There we go. Uh, and set the fill direction to be minus one. So if we've overshot our max, we make sure we don't overshoot the max, and then we start going backwards. Um, else if, I mean, we don't really need the, well, sure, why not? Else if uh, stroke force is less than zero, then we set stroke force to be equal to zero and set the fill direction to be positive again. And then finally, we check again on the fire button And if it's hit, we switch over to do whack instead. So we're either aiming, filling, or it's time to do whack. So here, yeah, let me, I'm gonna get rid of this update stroke mode. 
if it's not equal to do whack, then we'll return. Um, Cancel, 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 cancel. Change my mind again. All right, I just want this back here. Um, if it's not equal to do whack, we return. I'm going to do a different one. If stroke mode is equal to stroke mode dot um, ball is rolling, then I'm going to rename this to uh, check rolling status. Bam. And return. I mean, it's like it's slightly redundant in a way. Um, I mean, we could nest it because it's sort of that, but pff, I think this is fine. So if the ball is rolling, we're going to check the rolling status to see if it stops and reset it um, and then return. In any case, we don't want to continue down this unless we're in the do whack mode, and then we'll do the do whack logic. Now, do whack shouldn't exist as a boolean anymore. Oh, thought I got rid of you. There you go. Get rid of that. Um, so we don't need a test over here at all, because if we get to this point, it's time to whack it the ball, right? If we get to do, if we if we're not in phase do whack, we return. If we get here, we whack at the ball, um, and then we take the shot, and then we set the stroke mode to ball is rolling, and then we go back into waiting status. Yeah, we could do a switch, um, but I mean technically it'd be two switches, but then you'd be nesting it. I guess you could call a function, right? If it's the status, I would personally rather than enums, which I'm using here for slightly more simplicity. Um, as well as the ability to, you know, maybe maybe check the status over here. Like we could expose the uh, the stroke mode so that um, UI the UI can do things. The camera might want to do slightly different things depending on the stroke mode. Uh, we might want to enable various graphical things. Um, I, I don't know. Um, like we might want to expose this, but I'd be really tempted to use like delegates um, to implement the state machine so that our update gets chosen. But I mean, it's fairly okay. There you go. So, um, it's at zero. Oh, you know what I think I'm, we're gonna do just for visual thing, um, because we'll have to remember to reset the uh, the stroke force to zero, uh, which I guess could happen here. Reset it to zero. That way, there's nothing weird graphically going on. Filling isn't gonna work like you think. Okay, could be. So. Aiming mode is engaged. Hit spacebar. Uh, we're still in aiming mode. Oh, oh, yeah. So it sets the filling and then immediately goes here. And this is still true because it's the same frame. I think I'm going to want to put a return here, so there's at least a one frame delay. There's other things we could get. We could reset the get button up. But yeah, it's it's detecting it's firing, setting it here, and then immediately running here. I guess I could put an else as well. Might be a little cleaner than the visual return, although I don't tend to like nesting things too much. Because either way, we need like a one frame delay, and an else or the return works for it. Here, let's just do this. Also reset the stroke direction. Thank you. Hit this. There you go. That's filling, shrinking, growing. Whack it. Okay. Um, oh yeah, we did set. I set the uh, the max stroke. Maybe I will set. Keep it at fifteen. So let's see, can I get a hole in one? Well, it should actually skip over the hole, really. 
half force. We probably want to hide the arrow while we're in this mode as well. Okay, that's not too shabby though. Why did you just bounce? I think we may need, um, with the force meter, I'm wondering, do we want something like a little bit more, um, logarithmic? I'm wondering if, because of the bounce, if it's bouncing off the edge of this. That is a trigger. But yeah, because of the physics material, it may be hitting the little edge of this and doing a bounce off it. Yeah, what I probably want to do is leave the bounce on the walls quite high, um, but bring down the bounce everywhere else. And I think what we may do is um, duplicate, duplicate. Um, the default physics are going to be non-bouncy. Um, ball fizzmat will be bouncy. And the wall fizz mat will also be bouncy. Um, we may actually want to use like the min or something, but we'll see. Uh, mostly though, it is the kick out hole over here, which has a mesh collider on it, needs to have. Um... Hmm, actually, how do I want to do this? You know, instead of having. I'm going to keep the default physics to be bouncy. And, change, and just make a no bounce fizz mat. Just the things that we don't want it to have to be bouncy. For example, the floor itself, we actually don't want it to be bouncy. I mean, because of the, the AstroTurf on here, it would absorb all the bounce anyway. So we're going to do that. And then, yeah, the kick out hole, I will also set it to be no bounce on it. Yeah, a logarithmic stroke might work really well. Yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking. Whoops. Um. Now the bounce combine. I think it's the active object that uses its bounce combine. So we sort of want this to be set to minimum, perhaps, or maybe multiply. So the minimum of material will get used. It still bounced a little bit on the surface. All right. Why would you do that? The plane is set to the no bounce material. Uh, the ball, oh, needs its physics material. There you go. That's still bouncing on the tabletop. Do they all have to be set to min? Uh. Oh, I think I was doing it while the game was running. So it didn't save the uh, bounciness change. Why are you not on the ground? The arrow shouldn't have a collider, but let me check on that. I mean, and it wouldn't matter anyway. Like, A, it doesn't have a collider. Although, it probably is a good idea to, like, make it less thick, because it does look pretty stupid. Uh, 
Um, I think it may have to do with... That may have to shrink down a bunch. Because it was a one centimeter contact offset. At point... Yeah, point oh one. it had one centimeter contact offset. It wasn't um, precise enough there. So, I mean, that's one thing. Hold on. Hit play. There we go. And correctly doesn't bounce off the ground. That wasn't a bounce. What was going on there wasn't a bounce. It was a jitter because our collision offset was too large. There's a minimum distance at which it will try to resolve certain collisions um, just for optimization and to avoid like weird jitter effects. But because we're operating at such a small scale, we need to adjust that. So now if I hit this, hey, yeah, that's why I couldn't go in the hole properly and everything like that. It was entirely because of this value here, the contact offset which I should have actually taken a quick little uh, uh, look at earlier to make sure everything was okay. Now, um, we've got that. How is our wall bouncing? Did we break that aspect of things? No. There we go. The walls are quite bouncy. I mean, arguably, maybe too bouncy or not, but that's, you know, that's like infinite tweaking you can do. I don't know, it feels all right. Kind of feels okay. Uh, we are now 15 minutes over where I'd sort of planned to be, because we are going to switch to the gaming shortly. Um, we can very quickly consider other UI things like um, int uh, public int stroke count uh, get protected set um, now stroke count wouldn't start at zero, right? Like, because this is, if you were to sync the ball now, that's what you would mark down on your, uh, on your score sheet, right? So when you start a hole, the stroke count should start at one. And if you go into like the UI system, um, canvas. So what we could do is, so switch to 2D mode again, so I can see things properly. Um, add in, uh, UI text probably text message pro just for um you know what no i'm not going to import anything no stop i'll keep it i'll keep it sim delete go away i'll uh keep uh keep the project a little simpler we'll just use the regular text thing even though it's not as pretty um and you know you can do something like uh stick it in the uh i don't know the top left corner um Oh, I'm putting it in the wrong box. Canvas, top left corner. There we go. And then give you a little padding. Stroke, ba ba ba. Replace holderness, and then do something like stroke count UI. There you go. And just like the stroke force UI, I'll just copy, paste, except stroke count UI. Uh, not gonna get an image. I can do that. Uh, plus stroke manager dot stroke count. There you go. Um, and then so every time you whack it a ball, You plus one it really just plus one when it comes to a halt. Yeah, it's almost here. Stroke count plus plus. You know, unless unless we scored. So to check the scoring, you would add a collider, um, a trigger, I should say. Well, I mean, a trigger is just a collider that isn't a collider. Hard to describe. Um, inside the hole over here. So like I have a collider on top of the hole. This is used to toggle the ball from, um, you know, for its collision status. But what we would sort of want is we might generate a second version of the collider here. We'll remove the change ball layer component. Um, this is, you know, uh, scoring collider. It's set to is trigger. 
Uh, and what we want to do is we want to move it to the bottom. I mean, we could shrink it as well. We could make it very, very small. But we want it to basically be, if the ball has gotten to this bit, then um, we, can, we can count that as a score. So we'd have some sort of uh, scoring collider. There we go. And we'd have a void on uh, trigger enter like that. Debug.log score. Well, it's not score. It's like uh, whole complete. So, I mean, we didn't do the camera work, but that's not, I mean, you know, a little follow camera is fairly simple. I think we can probably more or less uh, leave it here, but... Um, You know, I think the max power does have to be brought down, because that was like, what, one quarter, one third? And it still goes across the whole thing. I think we'd like a little bit more fine control. Wow. Yeah, we need to, uh, we need to dramatically drop the max power, I think. Five? The effective feel of the power is also going to depend a lot depending on how much things bounce. Oh, I, I probably have to change the uh, speed at which it accumulates. All right, let's go 10. Um, but yeah, bring down the uh, the fill speed. Good job. And just tap it in. Okay, I was a little aggressive, but it still got in, and it did trigger the whole complete event. So at this point, what you would do is, you know, score, you know, yay, you got, you got it in, in two strokes kind of thing. Uh, oh, is the stroke counter updating? It should be, right? Yeah, there you go. Uh, well, I guess it'll update when it stops. There you go, stroke two. Um, and then loading a level. Now, loading a level, levels, you can think of them in two ways. You can think of it as loading a scene, but I don't think we'd want a separate scene for each level. I think instead what you have is some sort of, um, we'll call it level manager, even though, you know, in gar golf parlance, you would say, you know, hole manager or something, but I think it's a little bit more straightforward here. And then we'd probably have some sort of thing like um, a public uh, game object array of levels. And then you would have game object uh, cur level like this. Um, so our level, that's just that and that. Uh, and presumably has a prefab assigned to it. Yeah, okay. So yeah, our level manager is just going to have in this levels array. Oops, that didn't. It should just go. Uh, technically this should be a prefab. This level is a level model. We might want it to be a level prefab. Oh wait, we can delete this. Boom. Something like this, uh, and then like void despawn level is do something like destroy, oops, destroy cur level, like that. So your like um, level complete code is going to be something like uh, despawn the current level and then spawn the next one, um, like that. Increase the number, something of that nature. Boom, 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 boom. There you go. So you just need to like, you know, call at some point 
level complete and it'll load in the next one. So you just set up all your uh, your levels as some sort of prefab. I mean, here it's a model, but it can work. So I mean, theoretically, the better way to do it is to drop this in um, to an empty like that. Let's make sure to center you up inside and call this like level zero one underscore prefab. Just because you might you might want to do other Unity things to this. Drop that in there and in practice. Oh, yeah, let's see, like the whole, back up. This whole prefab needs to be inside of this. So there's the whole model and then the, or sorry, there's the level prefab and then there's the whole prefab as well. Uh, let me reset the positioning here just to make sure this is looking okay. Uh, undo, 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 undo. Prefab out, reset this positioning. There you go. Then put the whole prefab inside of this. There we are. And yeah, the other thing, it didn't keep um, it didn't keep its colors and things either for the level. Uh, so the plane over here wants uh, our grass texture on the plane. Excellent. So yeah, this becomes level zero one uh, prefab. Delete that one, put it in here. And then our level manager uh, will actually be loading from that prefab instead. So if I get rid of the prefab that's in the level and over here do something like uh, spawn level on start, and hit play. Hopefully the ball doesn't have time to like fall through the world. There you go. What is, there's still some crap out there. Oh, it's the arrow that I'm seeing. Okay, hit play. It'll spawn in the first level. There you go. And we are back to being able to play the game. And yeah, in theory, you get in the hole, trigger some sort of, you scored a point. Oh, there is the other thing with the prefab is the Oh man, all the materials, the colliders. Yeah, it's actually good that, boom, mesh collider. Uh, the flat plane wants to have the no bounce physics material on it. And the walls do need a mesh collider, but they're fine with the default. That's gonna be okay. Um, oops, apply all, delete. There we go, all right. Yeah, the wall ball went past the wall because the uh, the colliders weren't actually installed. It hit it too hard, but oh, almost on the bounce back. Almost on the bounce back. Yay, hole complete. And then, yeah, you would just trigger fireworks and things. Done. Would it be easier to start the strokes at zero, only increment after each whack? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's weird because, like, I'm just thinking from this play point of view, right? You're thinking, this is my first stroke. Like you're teeing up and you're looking at the display, it just says stroke one. I mean, unless, does it say zero? Would you think you'd want it to say zero and then you, as soon as you hit it, it goes up to one? Maybe, yeah, I guess maybe. Which, I mean, takes two seconds to change. It's mostly, yeah, how, how do we want the, um, the UI to uh, sort of sit? So, I mean, reset this to zero, make sure that's okay. And then the, um, Right, stroke count over here. Whacking it. Stroke count plus plus. Yeah, that's probably gonna end up being better. Good free camera system, maybe a Unity. Uh, that's true, actually. Um, so import, uh, I guess you get it from, from this thing, but yeah. I mean, doing follow code for a camera is pretty easy. I, I just don't know what the correct one would be. Um, and probably we'd want to end up doing custom camera code because, um, it's not just a question of following. Well, I mean, once you once you whack the ball, you probably want the camera to sort of, you know, follow the action. But when you're in like the setup phase, where do you want the camera to be? Do you want to be able to move it around? You know, um, should it just be from your point of view? Like, should the camera almost act like this and then you can sort of look a little and plan? Or should it be top down? Should it be toggleable? So that, that that's a whole other like sort of, 
discussion on usability and various decisions like that. I kind of like the idea of this like sort of vaguely first person-ish kind of thing, but it's not as handy for planning, especially if there's a bunch of stuff. Like what if there's like a big windmill in the way so you can't actually see the hole, but you want to be able to see the layout. Maybe there should be a button, something, I don't know. At least be behind the ball. Oh, the camera, yeah, it could be. I mean, that, that looks kind of, you know, it could look kind of sexy over here, right? If the camera was set up this way. Uh, oops, wrong context. The other thing that might be nice is you could put a little, um, you can have a little flag in the hole with no collision, right? To make it a little easier to see. I think that would be a good a good idea. Just, just you know, model up a little flag, put it in the hole, but put no collision in the flag itself. Or you could make it so that when your ball gets close to the hole, the, the flag gets removed or something, which is how you do it in golf. I mean, you still wouldn't put a collision on the flag because it doesn't need to exist, doesn't need to tie up the um, um, the physics system or anything. But yeah, and flag and hole, exactly. Yeah, I mean, in this mode especially, you don't need it at all. If you're playing top down, you don't need a flag because do you have a flag? Because you can see the hole really easily, right? You know, top down, isometric mode, pretty decent. And yes, the arrow should definitely be hidden when the ball is in a rolling state, um, and that would be easy to do. But we're gonna leave it here. Um, because the core of the game is here. I mean, really, at this point, I mean, a couple of cosmetic niceties and and just finish the, the logic for when the game ends, right? Because instead of just going into our uh, here, you know, to do. Uh, I mean, literally just find the stroke, uh, the, the level manager. Um, game object dot find by type uh, level manager, duh, 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 uh, complete, level complete. I mean, to do, maybe wait until you congrats the player. But I mean, there you go. Now, all of a sudden, multiple levels work. I mean, here, we'll just redo that. Um, the one thing we didn't do is on level load, in our level prefab, uh, there should be a spot to set the ball. So in inside of here, um, Either we could actually have the ball already pleasant at present, or maybe what we do is um, you have something like ball spawn spot. And so you just put this where the ball should start. So right over there, for example. Um, and yeah, then the ball will spawn in that area and have that be part of the prefab and then reset the ball position. Uh, level manager to do. Reset ball position. If you do that, all of a sudden you can have a hundred levels and a fully functional game. Um, and then, yeah, you you sugar it up with how do you want to keep score and do things like that. You know, do you want to have a par for each hole? Well, that's a whole other little bit of info that you could have. Although there's no reason you couldn't do that. You could have um, in your your level prefab. You could have something like um, level um, stats, level level data. All right, we have a little script on our, our level prefab called level data and all it really is like it may not do anything the level i mean maybe it's you know you can have some various code to you know activate your spinning windmill or whatever but what you're what you're mostly doing here is something like public int uh par you know par three and just expose that and then when you complete the level you can update the scorecard to do whatever mm -hmm. but yeah this project is is all the, all the broad strokes are ready to go. Man, now I'm tempted to do a, a, a mini putt game for uh, for Ludum Dare. I wonder if there's going to be a theme that would be vaguely compatible. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, we're not going to add multiplayer today. We could conceivably do it. Um, it. It wouldn't be that difficult, and it could be a lot of fun. You get the whole golf with fun, friends kind of thing. But we're going to wrap up the programming here. This thing will be, the video will be uploaded to the UbTubs uh, very shortly, and the files here will be uploaded to my GitHub uh, in theory after the stream ends. And uh, we'll go with all the broad strokes. Hey! <laughs> so many puns available for us. Uh, but we're gonna wrap it up here and we're gonna go and play some computer games. Now, um, we only have an hour and a half left to the stream. You guys will have to give me some feedback. Do you want to, do we wanna go and do some, some CK2? Do we wanna jump right into multiplayer? Do we wanna do something else? Um, let's see, a little bunch of CK2. Fallout themed mini golf. Oh. Uh, he, oh. One of the things, you know what I've been playing? What I've been, I've been, I actually did load up Fallout, but, um, 
Hearts of Iron 4 playing with the um, Old World Blues mod. I'm going to show you in the list. Old World Blues is a complete mod for Hearts of Iron that makes it the Fallout universe. It's insanely good. It's insanely good. Um, and there's going to be a video where Let's Play for it. This might be the thing that, that we do after we finish our Stellaris run. I don't know. But it, it's, it's really quite a nice mod.